We're going to find out who's going to the Super Bowl. Both of the playoff games are this weekend. There's DFS talk to talk about. And we're going to look back at the wide receiver position in 2020. Guys who were flukes, guys who will break out in 2021, who absolutely sucked in 2020. We will get to it all. And we're going to help you look good with Express because this episode of Fantasy Football Today is brought to you by Express. Express is all new and all about you with a fresh assortment of casual, versatile, and super comfortable styles find out more about express and their exclusive offer later in the show i'm dave richard i'm joined by jamie eisenberg and let's let's just jump right into the top no 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 no, every- no, 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 no. are you, you okay jump. are you okay yeah i'm okay why you sure why do i look like i'm in a hostage prison again no but philip rivers retired are you okay yeah 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 i i i'm 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 okay we'll talk about that that's not the biggest quarterback thing to talk about but i of course uh, it is Okay, fine. He retired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, long-time listeners of the podcast know that I have had a crush on Philip Rivers literally since he came into the NFL. Like, I, he was the first guy that I ever scouted for, like, an actual – did an actual scouting report on, and it blew me away um, in his bowl game. I think it was against Kansas. And I've just been a huge fan of his ever since, and he's, you know, been the Iron Man of the NFL since he's been in the NFL – and now he's gone, and now I can't take him with my last pick in some of my personal leagues or, you know, just be overall happy about him when he has a good game or, you know, love his stupid trash talk on the field. All this stuff. I, I, I am a huge Philip Rivers fan, and now that he's gone, I'm going to keep playing fantasy football and keep watching fantasy football and do all those things, but it's going to be a little different without Philip Rivers in there. So thanks for bringing that up, Jamie. That was special. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see what the Colts are going to do. I mean, they have so many, what do you think they're going to do? What do you think? Uh, don't tell me what you think they're going to do. Tell me what you would do. Oh, I I'd go get Carson Wentz. You know, I, I think they have a win now defense, uh, you mm-hmm. know, from what they were putting together. They have a win now offensive line. They have a win now run game, the passing game needs work. I mean, you know, you have a, a quarterback hole. That's the biggest issue. And you have a number one wide receiver hole. If T Y Hilton leaves, but even if he stays, I still think they need an upgrade at that spot. So their passing game is what's missing, and you need a passing game in the NFL. So uh, we saw the Jacoby Brissett experiment. That wasn't great for no. them. Uh, I don't think that better. was an experiment they wanted to do. Yeah, maybe it's better second time around, but I, I think we know the answer to that. So if you can't get Wentz or Stafford, I doubt they're getting Deshaun Watson because of the division rivalry. No chance. Um, right. You know, uh, Matt Ryan, you know, the guys that are going to be the veterans that are potentially available, uh, Sam Darnold, Jimmy Garoppolo, those type of guys. Then – you know, you got to hit the reset button. And, and that's, I think, going to set back their franchise because their franchise, like I said, I think is, is, is ready to compete now with the right quarterback in place. I would love to see Wentz there. I would love to see Stafford there. I read a story on The Athletic about the background, what, into, what went into drafting Patrick Mahomes in Kansas City. And Chris Ballard was there in Kansas City as part of that staff when they decided years before Patrick Mahomes was coming out that they wanted Patrick Mahomes and they knew that they had to trade up in a major way in the draft to get him. I wonder if there's a quarterback that Chris Ballard will see in this class that he'll say, I got to get him. And the Colts will move up from the bottom half of round one to the top half to try and get that quarterback if they can't get their hands on Wentz or Stafford. They were were aggressive in the draft last year to get they were. And do you know who they made the trade with to get Mahomes? Buffalo. Buffalo no no yeah can't Kansas City made the trade with Buffalo yep and look yep. how that worked out that worked out pretty well for uh for them for sure for both for sure it worked out yeah for both of they them. they got Tredavious White the two picks they got were Tredavious White and Traymond Emmons yeah those guys are good those are their best defensive players at this point okay speaking of Mahomes he, he he's rocking and rolling last week everybody saw him and then he gets kind of headlocked into the ground and out for the fourth quarter of the game, Kansas City hangs on to win. He practiced on Wednesday. It was limited. He's still in the concussion protocol. Now they said he did everything. He's fine. I think he's going to be good to go. I don't think there's really any question. How effective do you think there's, there's any way? I have no doubt, that, no concern about Patrick Mahomes. No, no tentativeness None. at all. Maybe Zero. he's going to be afraid, a little jittery in the pocket. Zero. What if someone tries to like suplex him or, you know, well, I mean, drop kick during the, the top game, rope? During the game is something different, but you know, going into the game, no hesitation. Okay. I think he'll be fine too. I'm not sure he's going to be like 350 yards and four touchdowns. Good. This Bill's secondary is playing well. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Another news point I want to talk about the lions. They got Dan Campbell as their head coach. 
I don't know where Dan Campbell ranked on everybody's list of head coaching candidates when the head coaching list came out, especially when, you know, guys like Eric Bieniemy were toward the top of the list. What do you, what do you make of this? Dan Campbell being the new head coach of the Detroit Lions. Cause I'm, I'm kind of scratching my head over it. So he's now number one in terms of coaches. I'd be afraid to fight. Right. Uh, so he ranks at the top of that list. Uh, if, if you could uh, imagine Pete Prisco and I, we sit there and watch games on Sunday. Uh, he always say, would you want to fight that guy? And would you want to fight that coach um, after a game? <laughs> and the answer is usually no to all of them. But uh, uh, the top of the, the, the list that we, we had, if I remember correctly, Mike Vrabel and Brian Flores were two of the guys at the top of guys you don't want to fight. Yeah. Um, uh, he's now number one. Campbell's now number one. Um, what do I think this means for the Lions? Uh, you know, we got to see who they hire as office coordinator when it comes to fantasy. Um, we got to see uh, if they keep Matthew Stafford, they keep Kenny Galladay. There's a lot of, it's same like the Colts. There's a lot of question marks with this team. Um, you know, I mean, Campbell was, uh, he did a nice job when he took over as the interim head coach for the Dolphins. Um, you know, he's got that, uh, he's got, he, he knows how to motivate players. That was certainly a, a big team coming out of those Dolphins teams. But, you know, in terms of being a head coach, yeah, I was a little surprised that he got a job over Eric Bannemi. Um, you know, they got a job over Leslie Frazier, you know, some of the guys that were out there um, uh, that, that you're still hearing, uh, Brian Dable, uh, for example, you know, some of those mm -hmm. guys that you thought. Yeah, he really should have been top, considered but, more, um, you know, in terms of what Campbell is going to bring to the Lions, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see when he hires his offense coordinator and what they do with their personnel. He's a former tight end. So I wonder if that'll be a good thing for TJ Hawkinson, that he'll get a little extra attention from the head coach and the head coach, you know, he looks at the NFL game from that perspective. Maybe that'll help. And he spent a ton of time with Sean Payton. Now, obviously he just came from the saints where he was an assistant head coach there, but he played for Sean Payton when Sean Payton was the play caller in Dallas, he was with Sean Payton in New York. So I wonder if there's going to be that type of influence too. And maybe that makes me a little more excited about him being the lions head coach is that he can potentially get creative. I don't think he can be what Sean Payton was, but I, I think that maybe that'll be a sign of like what direction they go and maybe it'll be a West coast ish type of offense. And if it leads on the tight end, then maybe it's going to be good for Hawk. So we'll see, by the way, who's the head coach that you would want to fight. Oh, uh, Vic Fangio came to mind was, was the one that really, came. I think Vic is, I think Vic could be a tough fight. I was thinking oh, Pete Carroll. I, I, none of them are easy. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I, know, I, know. I, went, I, I think when we, when we, when we figured it out, we looked at age. Uh -huh. and we looked That's at, why I would you know, say Carol. Huh? That's why I would say Pete Carroll is because of his age. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Pete Carroll was on the list. Uh, Vic Fangio was on the list. Uh, Bruce Arians was on the list. You know, we started with the old guys in terms of, like, who you'd want to fight for. But they'd all would kick my butt. I mean, there's, there's, not, there's, not, there's not a one that I would say, I have a shot to beat that guy up. No way. <laughs> right, Robert right, right. Sala might be number one, too. That's going to be he, close. He would be up there. Uh, he that's would true. be up there. That's true. He wasn't the head coach at the time we did this, and I should have put him in the conversation with Dan He's Campbell. He's got to be yeah, top five. Right? Brian Flores is probably the one that, uh, you know, I mean, you see him, he, he wants to fight players when they get into, yeah. into scuffles. He runs out <laughs> on the field. Um, uh, Vrabel, you know, we start with the former players. Obviously that's the, the first place you go. Yep. And, uh, and then you do, you know, you, you, you factor in size, you factor in, you know, just uh, scrappiness. I wish, I wish we would have written it down. Cause it was more like, uh, you know, we we're doing it off the top of our head. Yeah. And now I'm like starting to think of like other, coaches like Matt Nagy. I think it came it came up when um when Joe Judge got in a fight with Mark Colombo you know the report that he 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 punched yeah. Colombo mm -hmm. and well that tells me I don't want to fight Joe Judge it, well exactly because Mark Colombo is not a small he's person. a giant he's <laughs> right. a giant human right so yeah. I think uh I think you know some of the ones that we said that you you would you want to fight like Zach Taylor came to mind um yeah. he does he doesn't yeah yeah, yeah. he's tough. not very again, imposing yeah again Kick my ass, but uh, <laughs> that doesn't say very much. Um, who are some of the other ones we came up with uh, that you'd want to fight? Oh, Belichick, but again, you know, that's he would Pete. outsmart you, he would just outsmart you. True, it's true. Yeah, this uh, is more to be honest, it's more Pete fighting these guys than me fighting these guys. <laughs> Where's Brad Childress when you need him? All right, some more news and notes Clyde Edwards Alaire, Sammy Watkins, they were limited in practice. Uh, are we expecting them at this point, Jamie? Who knows? I mean, you know, two guys that have missed the entire postseason so far uh, for, for Edwards Hilaire. He's been out since week 15 when he suffered the ankle hip injury. Mm -hmm. At this point, um, you know, if in fact you do get Edwards Hilaire out there for any um, any DFS scenarios, I, I would go the other way. Especially right. the fact that he's still priced ahead of Daryl Williams on both sides. 
Yeah, kind of crazy. Stefan Diggs, oblique, he was limited. Gabriel Davis with an ankle didn't practice on Wednesday, but no Cole Beasley on the injury report. That might be a good sign for him going into this conference championship showdown. Uh, for the Bucks, no Antonio Brown at practice, knee injury. We'll see what he does the rest of the week. Better news for Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Rojo. They were all limited on Wednesday. Alan Lazard, Jamal Williams, A.J. Dillon, they were limited. Uh, let's talk about a guy that's not playing in the playoffs. Michael Thomas is likely to opt for surgery to repair both the torn deltoid and other injured ligaments in his high ankle. And so that got me to thinking. He had a high ankle sprain. McCaffrey had a high ankle sprain. We've seen other players get the high ankle sprain. And they don't always come back from it very cleanly in the same season. I'm thinking that this is like an injury that when, when you have a player starting next year that gets a high ankle sprain, you just head for the hills. You, you trade him. You get whatever you can. You say, forget it. He's not going to be the guy that I thought he would be when I took him. And you just take your losses and you get whatever you can and trade for him. Jamie, what I do guess you think? The, the opposite of that would be McCaffrey suffered a second injury to his shoulder. And so had he not suffered the shoulder injury, you saw what he was in that Kansas City game. So that was a separate issue. Uh, Saquon rushed back too soon, but he won a lot of people fantasy championships if you stuck with him and were able to make the playoffs because his final three games of the fantasy season were amazing two years ago. So, you know, okay. I mean, you just have to understand that this is probably a three to six week injury. And again, Michael Thomas, they, they purposely kept him out at the end of the season. He wanted to play. They, mm -hmm. they did it on, on their own due diligence, knowing that they were going to make a playoff run, which obviously they did. And so they wanted him fresh for the playoffs. So it's a case by case situation. It's not a bad idea to try and trade those guys, but you're put, you're trading them at the press value, which is never a good way to trade. And so, you know, if somebody is, you know, depending at what point in the season, these guys get hurt, you know, for these two guys in particular, it was week three for McCaffrey or week two for McCaffrey week one for Michael Thomas. Um, you know, if, if you get to week four, week five, week six of this injury, and they're still not back, you know, then maybe you try to trade them, but I, I think it's all case by case. I, I wouldn't necessarily put it as a, a high ankle sprain. They're done. Got it. But speaking of the high ankle sprain, Zach Moss apparently has it. He's having a surgery called a tightrope surgery. We're not going to see him play in, in any games anytime soon. The tightrope surgery, it's the same thing Tua had at Alabama. Not the big injury, but before he had that big injury at Alabama, he had this tightrope surgery to repair a high ankle sprain. He came back pretty soon from that. Uh, two more points. A.J. Brown underwent minor surgery on both knees. He said, quote, they told me I was done for the year after week two and just to refresh your memory he didn't play weeks two or three then he had 20 ppr points or more in four of his next five games and nine of his next 13. he played week four too right he, i think, it was I think he I, I think they were on bye in week four. Oh, oh you're right, you're right. And they yeah. came back i think yeah that was the uh schedule schedule snap with the steelers he, if he just put up these numbers on two bad knees what's he going to do on two good knees well he saw That's, it as a rookie yeah, I mean, he could be amazing. I look forward to drafting him in 2021. And someone that I'm not going to be looking forward to drafting in 2021 is Jerick McKinnon. He was on an Instagram live video with Debo Samuel. And he was asked, are you going to stay with the 49ers? You know, he's going to be a free agent. And he said, bleep, no. <laughs> he's done with the 49ers. I just thought that that was uh, kind of amusing that he would say that on a on a live stream with Debo, who will definitely be with the 49ers. Yeah, it's good, uh, good negotiating. Tell, tell yeah, team, right. you know, one of the, the, the 30 teams that have a chance to, to sign you, 31 teams that have a chance to sign you. Uh, goodbye. I, I'm, I'm not so sure that he's going to have a, have a chance to sign anywhere. 29 years old, has a ton of injuries, oh, he'll tired legs toward the end of the year. You think he'll go somewhere? Yeah, he'd play on special teams. He can do, he, he's, he's a capable third or fourth running back for a team. Do you think he'll have any like interviews or anything with a, with one of these teams where he's going to have to dress nice and look good and feel good when he's talking with, uh, with, with a general manager or head coach? I would, I would hope so. But with today's society being on zoom would probably be uh, as casual as he wants. But if he wanted to dress up and he wanted to look sharp and he wanted to wear clothes that really gave off the image that he's not done and he's ready to keep playing football, would you suggest that Jarek McKinnon go to Express or Express.com and buy a whole wardrobe of clothes so that he can send that message to other teams? Yeah, I mean, I, I did that. Uh, I'm excited for uh, you did to, to, to NFL take, teams to take all. Well, not for, well, yes, for I guess for NFL teams because I'm going to take all of my Express clothes plus the clothes that I'm uh, planning to purchase soon uh, on Express.com for the Super Bowl for Super Bowl 55. Going to Tampa, we have a lot of shows planned, so I'm excited to. Uh, display my express wardrobe 
Uh, just because I think, you know, you start off 2021 right with a fresh look and that's with express feeling yeah. confident in my clothes matters. Uh, looking sharp on the podcast and CBS sports HQ matters. It boosts my confidence and gets me all ready to provide fancy advice all day long. Crust the wrinkle resistant fabric is easy to take care of, which eliminates the trips to the dry cleaner. Start the new year right with an all new look with express shop express and stores and online express.com. Now that's express.com. Go there now. Look fresh, look right, look ready to go. Absolutely, Jamie. Thank you for that. All right. Before we talk about the playoff games that are coming, let's take a look back at wide receivers in 2020. The ones that we thought were kind of fluky, the ones who had poor performances, the ones who we think might be done, the ones that could bounce back. Who uh, who knows what else we'll talk about here, but let's just start with the flukes. Jamie, a wide receiver that had a flukish 2020. I'm going to go with Corey Davis. You know, I, I think he was very good for fantasy. He was great for the Titans. Uh, really for the first time in his career. You know, we know that they're, uh, they went into the season planning to move on from him. We'll see how they feel coming out of the season, if he's going to get an opportunity to stay there. But I just don't know if he's going to be a consistent producer year over year. And as we saw, there were some highs at, was at the end of the season, had a couple of big games. There were obviously some lows during that stretch as well. And, you know, he, remember we go back to the beginning of the season, he had that stretch of uh, basically it was 11 or more, or it was right around just 11 PPR points. You know, he was just hitting that number on a consistent basis. Sure was. Was, was, was nice, but um, I don't know if I want to target somebody who's just going to hit 11 PPR points, you know, and, and again, we've seen the body of work. Uh, we've seen what he was. There's a, there's a change coming for the Titans with an offense coordinator uh, replacement with Arthur Smith now gone. So if he stays in Tennessee, I think he's got a chance to still be a, a number three fantasy receiver, but a guy that I, uh, I'd settle for as opposed to target. If he goes somewhere else, we'll see what that means for him. But he's not somebody I'm excited about for next year. No, neither am I. I, I like him as like a floor play wide receiver three, because that's really what he was for most of 2020. 10 of 14 games with at least 10 PPR points, and he faded a little bit toward the end of the year. I don't think he's ever going to be that type of dominant number one receiver. We'll see what happens. But I, I, I think he's going to be one of those guys that, like you said, number three receiver at best and someone that you can use not necessarily sparingly, maybe he's your primary third receiver in three receiver leagues, but you should be open to the idea of benching him for wide outs with more upside. My fluke is Robbie Anderson, who had a great season first year in Carolina, eight games with 15 plus PPR points in 2020, 12 with 10 or more PPR points. So kind of like Corey Davis, he had a lot of games. The majority of his games were with 10 plus PPR points. He was safe. But the two years prior, and maybe you just chalk this up to being with the Jets and the whole Adam Gase stuff, maybe that's what you do. He had eight total games with 15 PPR in the two years prior to getting to Carolina. And so I don't know if last year was a byproduct of, oh, Robbie Anderson's really good, and it doesn't really matter that he was playing with an okay quarterback. He just had that opportunity. Or did he just have a flukish year where he had this big opportunity for one year, one time, and then after that, He's going to be a dud. So I'm not reaching for Robbie Anderson. I might take him ahead of Corey Davis. It really depends on where Corey Davis goes, but I view him the exact same way as a number three receiver who I'm okay starting at the beginning of the year, but I'm looking to replace at some point during the season. Do you feel me on that one, Jamie? Not at all. I, I like Robbie Anderson's situation a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think last year was a fluke. I do think leaving the jets was huge. I do think getting stability with a better play caller was huge. I do think that, the fact that Curtis Samuel is an unrestricted free agent, if he leaves, it opens up more targets. That's obviously something that we have to see. But uh, I think he's, you know, proven that when he's gotten good quarterback play and doesn't have to be great, but just good, which is what he got last year, that he's been able to put up good numbers. I think leaving Adam Gase was huge for him. I think leaving that disaster of a situation in the Jets was huge for him. Um, so I, I don't think last year was, was a, a fluke by any stretch. I think last year is certainly replicable um based on what this offense may look like going into 2021 so I, I like him leaps and bounds over Corey Davis and I think he's got a chance to still be a borderline starter and mostly did I read right that Adam Gase is a candidate to be an offensive coordinator at Bama did we talk about this I think we did uh yes yeah, so is Bill O'Brien so uh uh Nick Saban is is going to put those guys through his car wash and see what happens there but there, there's a track record for both those guys with with uh with Saban uh I think Gase was an assistant for him at one point uh in one of their might staff. have been okay we talked so, about before uh, I'm not going to do it again yeah, so okay. we'll see. Hopefully Gase doesn't ruin the kids coming out of Alabama. Bounce back candidates in 2021, Jamie. Is there a receiver that you're already looking at that you're going to say, forget about what you saw in 2020, 2021 is the real deal? Yeah, I mean, you've heard me say this a lot uh, since mm -hmm. the Jaguars locked up the 
opportunity to get the first pick in the NFL draft and get Trevor Lawrence and, and DJ Chark. You know, he was somebody that I thought was going to be a top 20 fantasy receiver in 2020. Uh, I thought going into his third year after what he showed you as a sophomore, that it was going to be a huge season for him and injuries played a part, obviously poor quarterback play played a part, whether you are a Gardner Minshew guy or not. Um, those two guys weren't on the same page. Chark complained about Minshew. The Jaguars obviously weren't ha happy with Minshew. And then the guys who backed up Gardner Minshew were a disaster as well. Mike Lennon shouldn't be a quarterback in the NFL at this point. Um, uh, Jake Luton didn't prove himself to do anything. So uh, the quarterback upgrade is the biggest thing. We'll see if they add another receiver and who that person may be to uh, either put Chark into a number two role or give, you know, another player an opportunity to take some targets away. But I think DJ Chark, again, will be somebody that has top 20 potential. I don't rank him that high but he'll be in my top 30 for sure. And somebody that I will target, uh, like I said, when we were reviewing the mock draft, somewhere in the round five to seven range, but I will be aggressive with DJ Chark next year. Seven games with 15 PPR points in 2019. So I, I bought into DJ Chark too. I thought he'd be outstanding in 2020. He only had three such games last year and the quarterback issues were a problem. I took a very quick look at Trevor Lawrence's top targets at Clemson. And his number one guy was actually his slot guy, Amari Rogers, 77 catches, 1,020 yards, seven touchdowns. But he had another receiver that he threw to a lot, Cornell Powell, who wore number 17, who was six feet tall and over 200 pounds and seemed like a downfield threat. He's more like Chark than Rogers was, 53 catches, 882 yards, and seven touchdowns. Those were his two big weapons there. I'd like to think that DJ Chark absolutely has a chance to rebound. And I think Jerry Judy has a chance to rebound. And I don't have, I, I don't, I can't use stats to back it up. I can't look at what he did in 2020 and say, well, he's got this going for him and that going for him. He was second in the NFL in drops. Dante Johnson, shout out. You were first. I'm, I, I'm, I was frustrated with how he played. I know that he didn't have a lot of big games and we saw all these other rookie receivers do well. I'm real curious what the Broncos end up doing at quarterback. If they keep Drew Locke, then maybe I won't be quite as excited about Jerry Judy. And I know that Corlin Sutton's coming back, and, and I've taken Sutton in some of our mocks already. But I just I think the talent is still – I think it's there. It's going to get closer to the surface. His last game was good. I, I'm, I'm hoping that Jerry Judy rebounds. And right now I'm kind of going back and forth in my mind on where's that range where – I'm not reaching too hard on Judy because I think someone in every draft will have that mindset of Judy can't possibly be this bad in 2021. And they're going to go and look for Jerry Judy in the draft. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious where he went in our drafts and, and, and where he will continue to go. And I, I feel like he's worth the risk in round six. And I, I actually, I didn't look to see where he went in our drafts. Maybe, you know, Jamie, uh, if you've got that, I think I took him in one. I'll, I'll tell you in a second. Yeah, but I, I, I think that round six is the time to take him. And just comparing him to Robbie Anderson and Corey Davis, I think there's no question I'm going to take Jerry Judy ahead of Corey Davis. But I think it's, it's how you feel about Robbie Anderson. If you really think that Robbie is going to keep putting up nice, solid floor numbers like we talked about, 12 games of 10-plus PPR points with some smash games mixed in, then you'll take Robbie Anderson ahead of Jerry Judy. But if you think that – I think the upside play is definitely Judy because he's got a chance. We don't know if Corlin Sutton's going to be a hundred percent back from ACL. I think Judy does have a chance to outperform somebody like Robbie Anderson. And that's why I think I would end up taking Judy over Robbie Anderson and then settle for Robbie Anderson. If I don't get my hands on Judy, if someone else who's really excited about Judy gets him in the draft. Yeah. The upside play is obviously Jerry Judy. Uh, Judy went in round seven in our PPR draft. Uh, oh, all right. Robbie Anderson. He did. Um, by how far? Where Robbie Anderson? Oh, uh, not that far. Uh, <laughs> how stupid! I took both of them. <laughs> um, yeah, so I took Judy in round seven, Robbie Anderson in round eight. Okay, and, and Judy went in round, round seven third, and a half PPR too. Third and fourth receivers. Um, yeah, I mean the upside play is, is obviously Jerry Judy. I, I think there's a lot to like about what he can become. Uh, Cortland Sutton's recovery is going to be a big part of that, but you know Judy is. Uh, a guy that runs great routes. Like you said, he's a guy Perfect. that has a hard time catching the ball. Like you said, um, you know, they were trying to get him going toward the end of the season. I do think Drew Locke is back as their quarterback. I do think that a year in the system, a full off season will help him. He has arguably, and it's not at the top because not even the top of his own division, but he has arguably the best set of receivers around him in the NFL. You can make a case for with his tight end and his receiving core when healthy, because if KJ Ham was your third guy and he becomes what, a lot of people projected him to become and top Patrick off the defense guy. guy. And, mm -hmm. and 
you know, you have those, those guys one through four with that tight end, that's a great group. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of room to grow for those guys, but Drew Locke has to get them there. And so Judy can be the leader of that group. I don't think there's any question about it. He was drafted to be that way. Uh, pedigree is there, but uh, he's got a lot to prove. So he's going to be one of those guys that I think a lot of people are going to say breakout candidate for 2021 are uh, going to, you know, put that label on him and, and rightfully so, but just depends on where you draft him and who you draft him ahead of, or, you know, who you miss out on by taking him too soon. He's just such a talented player. I really, I still can't get over how bad his drops were in 2020. Hey, what about a player that you're going to drop? You're done with them. A wide receiver that you're just don't want to draft him in 2021. Yeah. I took low hanging fruit on this one and took uh, Julian Edelman. Um, you know, it's a, uh, it's a shame. Uh, you know, he's been so good for fantasy uh, when he's been healthy, but you know, unless they get the second coming of Tom Brady or he gets let go and goes someplace where he has a better quarterback, you know, they're, they're obviously hitting the reset button on, on this team. The one thing that could change, uh, you know, slightly for Julian Edelman would be if, if it's a guy like uh, Jimmy Garoppolo, just because there's a history there, you know, him walking in, knowing the system, being comfortable in Josh McDaniels offense, if McDaniels does in fact stay, um, which it looks likely. So I, I think if you get, some semblance of continuity, you know, Edelman will still return some value, but I mean, we're talking about, you know, double digit round receiver at this point, you know, he's not going to be anybody that someone's going to target in drafts. Um, I'm going to have a tough decision this off season because he's on one of my dynasty rosters and I'm running out of space of players that I want to hold on to, to speculate on. And so do I make a move to get rid of Julian Edelman? I'll probably end up keeping him because we, it's, it's a dynasty league that we're both in together, Dave, and, and mm-hmm. we play, uh, up to five receivers if we want to. And he's, uh, he's like my seventh receiver. I have a really good receiving core there. But, you do. It's amazing. Um, I, don't, I don't know if, uh, if I can justify going into the draft where I have to make, you know, five roster cuts, six rosters, six, cut six players to get, you know, open spots for the draft if he's going to make the cut. That, that's how, you know, good my team is. But um, I, I would like to hold on to Julian Edelman in that scenario, but I think that's the kind of decision some people have to make in some dynasty rosters. Do you think there's a chance he ends up reuniting with Brady somehow, some way? Uh, there, there's an obvious, uh, you know, opening if the Patriots move on from Godwin and move on from Antonio Brown or one of those guys. And, and Brady says, hey, get me, you know, Edelman for one more run, you know, depending how this year finishes for them. I, I can mm-hmm. see that happening for sure. But um, would that make you interested in in like not just keeping him, but putting him in your lineup in that dynasty league that we're talking about? He where won't you can crack that receivers? lineup. Uh, I mean, again, you know, I'm, I'm lucky with that team because my receivers are Michael Thomas, Kenny Galladay, Tyreek Hill. Uh, Justin Jefferson, Deontay Johnson, uh, I think that's five. Um, he's never going to play over those guys, you know, so I also have Michael Gallup and, and one other guy too. Um, so, you know, for me, he's never going to play on that team, but I, I think for people that have him as a fourth receiver, fifth receiver, you know, in those type of formats, you know, then you, you'll be more excited about it if he's reunited with Brady. You know, that's the thing. He's got to be with somebody who is going to lean on him. He's got to stay healthy. You know, that's a big part of it as well. He's old. <laughs> he's old. Yeah, he's seriously. Down. Yep. He's got a bad quarterback situation. So not, not a very ideal uh, fantasy wide receiver. Not a lot to like about Julian Edelman in 2021. I want everybody listening to, to pick a round. Jamie, you can do this too. Pick a round in your mind where you would feel comfortable drafting Odell Beckham. Now, I know for a fact you're not going to say round one, round two. Maybe a few of you might say round three. I would say quit living in the past if you do. I don't want to take him with at least a pick in the first six rounds. I just, I know what his upside is, but I've seen his downside now for each of the past, what is it like three or four years where he's gotten hurt. I mean, you know, he's good with the Giants, but. Well, but his first three years in the, right. First three years in the NFL, he was great. No one can say anything. He was on his way to being like one of the elite receivers in the NFL and just his last year with the Giants. And then his time in Cleveland just hasn't been that same guy. Injuries have been the biggest factor attitude has been a factor as well uh, I, I would say that i'm done with him except in both of the mocks that we did he went in round seven and i i can't fault anybody for taking a guy who can give you you're not drafting him to be a stud week in and week out all season if he does that for you that's great but when he plays if he can give you stud numbers half the time i think that's worth taking a chance on in round seven but before then i can't do it i just think that he just hasn't been special enough to warn a pick even that high as a top 60 type of player. I mean, obviously recovery is going to be a big part of this. How healthy is he, you know, for the start of the season, you know, what do the Browns, you know, talk about tinkering in their offense. Rashard Higgins is a free agent. So if he leaves, you know, that's one less mouth you have to worry about feeding as the number three receiver. Um, 
but I, I think the, the, the encouraging part of, of Beckham is, and this is probably like a Ben Gretsch thing, when the highs are high, you're going to be thrilled to have him on your team. The lows are going to be something you have to deal with. Now, he had two. He had one really big game of the six that he played. Dallas, 38-point right? game against Dallas. Yeah. And he had uh, uh, a couple of others that were okay, but there were a few that were, were down. He averaged seven targets a game in the six games that he played in Kevin Stefanski's offense. And if you go back to the two years that he played with the Browns, the 22 games, half of those he hit 11 PPR points or more. So the floor wasn't bad in half of those games. But I do think the, uh, the opportunity for him to be an elite level fantasy receiver, it's going to take a miracle in this offense, but he still could be a serviceable low end starter for you, but he's no longer a guy. I, I'm with you. I think round six is the spot that I would start to look for him. Round five is, is probably too soon because we're going to see receivers. You know, it's just the, the, the trend started last year. It's going to be even more so this year where those first two rounds are going to be dominated by running backs. Round three is going to be a split. And then three through five is going to be wide receiver, probably 10 through 30. And so does he fall into that category? Probably, but he also might be outside of that. And so it's just going to be a mad rush of wide receivers in, in late round three, round four, round five. And I think he's going to be just outside of that, depending on how his recovery goes from the ACL. Three games in his last 23 with the Browns with 18 plus PPR points. Now I would say you're 18 talking about plus elite PPR. level numbers there. That that's 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 superstar level. Right, but he he's rarely going to do that. I don't think that there's a chance that he can do that. Like when Devontae Adams plays, you expect him to get more than 18 PPR points in a game because he's yeah, well, I mean, you know, he he's no longer in that mix. He's he's, he's in the not even close. Jerry Judy mix. He that that's where Odell Beckham is right now. Now he has the ability to surpass those guys if things are right. I think the unfortunate thing for Beckham is like the entire 2019 season, because Freddie Kitchen's offense was a disaster. Everything was just bad for the Browns all the way around. This offensive line, better Baker, uh, better compliment around him because I think, you know, Hooper helps, you know, just from a, a more competent tight end, opening up things in the middle. I, I, I would have loved to see Beckham, you know, staying through the course of the season, just how things would have finished for him because had things finished probably the way that they started, he would have, you know, he's going to, I don't know where you're going to rank him, but he'll be in, you know, somewhere around 30 for me. And if he, if he, if he had finished the season, I think playing at the level that he showed you in those first six games, he's probably closer to 23, 24, as opposed to I'm putting him at 30 with the hope that he gets back to something close to what he was, as opposed to, okay, I'll settle for him here. I haven't ranked it yet, but I think I would rather take the player who I think is ascending in Judy which is yeah, weird to say because he hasn't been great, obviously, sure. than a player who could be descending in Odell Beckham. Yep. So of, of the receivers that we've talked about, um, I, I think I'm taking Judy ahead of them all pretty much. But let's talk about some receivers who I would take ahead of Jerry Judy. Guys that can break out in 2021. Jamie, give me one receiver. Oh, T. Higgins. I mean, there, there's a lot, obviously, that fall in this category, but T. Higgins is somebody that uh, I, I'm sure a lot of people are excited about. Um, you know, you saw the, the potential basically from week three on until Joe Burrow got hurt in week 11 that he, uh, he is, he's got superstar material. And, you know, moving on from A.J. Green, that opens up more targets. Uh, we'll see what they do to replace Green, if, in fact, Green leaves. I mean, there's obviously a chance you can still come back. But um, Higgins is going to be their number one guy. He, he, he looked the part. Um, you know, I think a lot of people were looking at this uh, as – as 2021 as the season for him to, you know, start to uh, show something, but he accelerated that by leaps and bounds in his rookie campaign. So Burrow to Higgins, hopefully they get an off season to work together. Uh, he's going to be a potential top 15 wide receiver for me going into the season uh, in terms of rankings and um, you know, a guy that will go in that round four range for sure. I love T Higgins. I think he's got a chance to ascend to be a top 12 receiver in fantasy this year. So looking forward to battling with you to get him in all of our drafts. I said, I, I was talking about a receiver, a, a breakout candidate that we would take ahead of Jerry Judy. I, I got a name that I don't think I'm going to do that with, but I still like his chances to have a big year. And that's Michael Pittman with the Colts. I'm assuming T Y Hilton's out the door. That'll open things up for Pittman to be the number one receiver there. I don't know what they're doing at quarterback, but I can't imagine they're going to half-ass it and go with Brissett. I, I, I like the size that he gives, and I like that he's already running crossing routes. He can add to that this offseason, be a little more of a refined receiver. 
don't like the fact that he only had one touchdown in 2020, but he had a catch rate of 66%, 8.2 yards per target. I think he can improve on certainly the yards per target, but the catch rate, maybe a little bit that goes up, but I think that he's got a chance. I see him and I see Mike Evans. I see a big dude who's like a basketball player who can post up on smaller defensive backs and just rake in touchdowns. And I think Indianapolis is going to lean on that. I think that's a great option for any quarterback off of play action because Jonathan Taylor will be a big threat in the run game. That'll open things up downfield for guys like Pittman. And if Hilton's not there, the opportunity is for Pittman to be the number one guy. Pittman would be someone that I would probably look to take right around that Judy Beckham range, around seven-ish is where I'd really like to get him and hope that he can start the season maybe on my bench, potentially as a number three receiver, but work his way up into being maybe a top 24 receiver by the end of the season. Potentially. I mean, you know, I, I do think Hilton comes back. I, I could see a, a hometown discount for there for him to stay there. You know, I, I, he just seems like that type of guy. He's, he's pretty loyal. They're pretty loyal to him. Uh, but I don't think that matters for Pittman. I, I think he is going to be the number one receiver there. It's just a matter of obviously what the quarterback situation looks like, who's the third receiver, which of the tight ends are back as well. You know, they have some decisions to make there. Uh, but yeah, Pittman absolutely has a chance to, uh, to fall into this category. Another, another, you know, very popular breakout candidate um, as most of these second year wide receivers will be. Yes. So uh, there, there's, there's a lot to like, you know, especially for what his, uh, his opportunity is there in this offense. And I've been intoxicated by Colts wide receivers before <laughs> bears. Uh, hopefully Pittman does a little bit better than Mr. Campbell does in Indianapolis. Yeah. Okay. When we come back from this break that you're about to hear DFS talk for the conference championship games, four teams, one lineup. Let's go. It's the Battle of the Bays, and San Francisco is not involved. Tampa Bay, Green Bay, winner goes to the Super Bowl, loser goes home. And two of the greats, I actually had a debate with my brother-in-law about whether Aaron Rodgers belongs in the conversation of second-best quarterback in NFL history, because everybody gives it to Brady. I think the conversation should be had, but my brother-in-law put it like this. He has to win the Super Bowl this year. He has to win the MVP and then win the Super Bowl. And then they can talk about Rodgers being ahead of guys like Peyton Manning or Joe Montana or whatever. I'm not even sure that that matters because Aaron Rodgers has been just amazing throughout the majority of his career. I think the argument can be made. I'm not saying that it is this way, but the argument can be made that Aaron Rodgers is the second best quarterback in NFL history. He's got to get the second Super Bowl. You know, I, I think you'll, uh, You'll get, you get more people on that side um, because he's going to win the MVP this year. He obviously has the numbers uh, by the end of his career to be in that conversation. He's not going to catch Peyton. You know, just the, uh, the way that his, his career started, um, you know, being on the bench, that, that'll hurt him in terms of his overall career numbers. But his efficiency is going to be better. Um, his, his turnover rate is going to be better. Uh, I think a lot of people will still put Peyton in that category. Um, and Peyton's going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer once we find out uh, the, the results of the voting. For sure. Easy one. Yep. Um, but yeah, he's, he's, he's in the conversation. He's already in the conversation to be on the Mount Rushmore of greatest quarterbacks of all time. Uh, you can't watch him play and not think that, but he needs, he needs some of those secondary numbers to, to back that up. And the Super Bowl win will, will help that along with the second MVP, but, um, he's got a good shot. I mean, they're, they're playing great football right now. And so can they overcome their worst loss of the season, which was yeah. against Tampa Bay in week six? It sure was They're three point favorites. Do you have a favorite DFS play in the game between the bucks and the Packers? Um, I'm going to go to Ronald Jones as a guy that I like in this game. You know, I hope that he's healthy. I, I do think that, uh, people are going to run to Leonard Fournette. I get it. He's the better player in this game based on what we saw the last two games for Tampa Bay, but I like the way Jones ran in the game last week against new Orleans. And I think if he's healthy, he'll get some more opportunities to run the ball. Um, but you have to worry about the injury, but just based on price, you know, he's somebody that I'm going to look at a lot. Uh, Brady, somebody I'm going to look at a lot as well, just because he's the cheapest of the four quarterbacks playing. Hopefully he still is, uh, playing as consistent. The, the thing I am concerned about though, is, um, this is a tough matchup for their receivers for Tampa Bay because Jair Alexander is playing unbelievable right now. Kevin King's playing really well and they can negate those guys, especially if Antonio Brown is not 100%, which clearly right now he's not dealing with that knee injury. So can Brady get by, as we saw in the uh, in the previous round against the Saints, you know, with throwing to his running backs? He did that against Washington as well with what Leonard Fournette did. Can he get by throwing to Cameron Brayton, and taking some shots with uh, Gronk? You know, somebody's going to have to get him that third touchdown for him to be successful because he'll probably get two. He had two in the first matchup as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
but you know, Brady is, is great. And then, like I said, on the uh, fantasy football today in five show that we did Cameron Brady's one of my favorite plays in this game, just because of his price. Uh, he's cheaper than Gronk by $200 on each site, FanDuel and DraftKings. And he's had more targets in the two playoff games. He's had more catches in the two playoff games. He's become a go-to option for, for Brady right now. So I think just based on his price tag and what his production has been, he's going to be in a lot of my lineups also. Where does Valdez Scantling rate for you as a DFS play? Because I think he might be, I don't know if he's going to be a favorite play. Like I can't wait to get him in my lineup type of a play, but I, I figure that the Bucks run defense already good and they're going to get Vita Vea back in the middle of that. That's going to make things tough on the Packers run game. And we've seen the secondary have lapses before in Tampa Bay. I know they didn't quite have nearly as many last week because Drew Brees and, and the noodle arm really made them look better than I think they actually are. And I I'm focused on trying to differentiate my lineup in, in DFS this week, because there's going to be a lot of crossover. I mean, there's only four teams playing. Yep. So, so I wonder if Valdez Scantling, his price isn't really that bad. It's 3,900 on DraftKings. I wonder if, if you're going into a tournament, you just have to put him in there and you have to hope that he connects with Rogers on a deep throw or two. I mean, the thing, the thing that's encouraging is you had, uh, three receivers with eight plus targets for the Packers last week. Adams was double digits. And then Valdez Scantling and Lazard both had eight. Lazard was the beneficiary last week. He had the big play, scored a touchdown. A uh, lot of things you, you find on social media about how that play was set up and Rogers and, and uh, Matt LaFleur knew it was a touchdown as soon as they saw the, the formation of the defense. So is it a Lazard week? Is it a Valdez Scantling week? They'll take shots to Valdez Scantling. It's just a matter of will he connect. So he's obviously should be in your lineups if you're trying to differentiate yourself for sure. You know, him, Gabriel Davis, you know, these type of players, the, the third option, the fourth option, Nicole Hardman, Demarcus Robinson. These are the type of guys that help you win. Cameron Brait, these type of players, you know. So these, these, this is the way you set yourself up to be successful is having players like this. So absolutely, after an eight-target game, with what he's shown you, two of his last six, he had two huge games prior to last week. So if he hits, you're in great shape. If he misses, you didn't put the right player in your lineup. But again, if you're trying to win big, he is an absolute play for you this week. That's what I'm going for. I'm trying to win big. I want to be a little different. And I'm hoping that he won't be popular um, compared to a lot of other players in, in the two games this weekend. I also think the Packers defense is worth paying up for. I don't really like any defense this week. Let's face it. It's the conference championship. These are the four, best four, four teams. Four of the best in the quarterbacks in the, of the NFL this year. Right. So why you have to play one. And so what I'm thinking is that the majority of the people who are going to send a lineup, they're just going to punt. And they're going to put in Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay is the cheapest defense on DraftKings. Uh, Buffalo is the cheapest defense on FanDuel. I, I want to go the other way. I want to zag when they're zigging and take a chance with the Packers defense, which, by the way, has been playing really well for the last, I would say, four or five weeks. And I know that Cam Akers ran pretty nicely against them last week, and they started to look like that bad run defense that they were in the middle of the season. But you talked about the secondary, and I think the pass rush is going to be good. And it's Tom Brady, who is capable of having a huge game, but last week was an example of him not putting up a lot of huge numbers. So I'm thinking that maybe the Packers' defense is, is a sneaky play this week in this game, just to differentiate and, and the other problem is that it is expensive and you are going to burn a lot more of your salary to go with the Packers defense. But if, if you have any thoughts on that, Jamie, you can let me know if that's a good idea or should I just, I would people personally just play the bills defense because they're cheap. And if Mahomes gets hurt again, you know, he's got the toe injury. You no, know, everybody's overlooking the, the toe, the, the, the toe foot problem. If that flares up and he can't go for whatever reason, that's the defense that I'm going to look at. Because like you said, they're all playing, the thing, the thing about what we, what we tend to overlook when we talk about these great offenses, because you get mesmerized by them, the teams that make these Super Bowl runs, their defenses get overshadowed. The Chiefs' defense last year was playing so well toward the end of the season, unless you have like the 49ers defense, you know, which was the strength of their team. Right. But when you have these great offenses, all four of these offenses are so good. But the Packers' defense, why have they been successful recently? Their defense has been great. The secondary getting healthy. We talked about that at the end of the fantasy season. Once they got Alexander and King back on the field, it was very difficult to throw against them. The Bills defense, what they did last week was fantastic. You're starting to see a little bit better performance on that side of the ball. And then the two teams in uh, the, the, well, the Packers, excuse me, but the, the Bucks getting Vea back, what their secondary was, getting Carlton Davis back. Remember, he missed the end of the season, so that secondary did. is a lot better. So I don't know if there's a great defense to play this week. I probably would go the opposite route and avoid spending the extra money on the Packers, even though they are playing better, and Brady going outside in the cold could be a bad 
situation for him. So they're a good defense to use. But if we're just talking about saving a few bucks, uh, like on FanDuel, you save $1,000 by going from the Packers to the Bills. And if Mahomes suffers a re-aggravation of the toe injury, I'll take my chance. You're going to look good. Sure. Against Chad Henney. Sure. I get that. I get that completely. Uh, Kelsey was amazing in the game last week. And I bring that up. And we'll talk about this game in a second. It's the Bills and the Chiefs. The winner goes to the Super Bowl. Kelsey was one of the guys that Jacob Gibbs talked about in our FFT and five podcast last week. He mentioned uh, in great detail about how he does against zone and how zone defenses really open things up for guys like tight ends. And it was, it was awesome advice and it was a must listen. And Jacob's going to be back with me on FFT and five tomorrow for the playoff games. He's going to have more of these amazing stats. You can get all the stats that you need for both that game, Bill's chiefs and for bucks Packers on that episode. And it's just five minutes long. And, and the notorious Connor McGregor is back. UFC 257 is live this weekend from Abu Dhabi and McGregor will be headlining versus Dustin Poirier. This will be their second time fighting. Connor won the first match via first round TKO, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't count out Dustin who's 10 and two since losing to McGregor back in September of 2014, man, what a rematch and morning combat is the place to get all of your UFC 257 content fighter interviews like with Poirier Chandler and more previews with UFC hall of famer Rashad Evans. And of course, instant reaction to UFC 257 right when it ends download and subscribe to morning combat on Apple podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever else podcasts are found for the best coverage around the combat sports world. And again, the name of that podcast is morning combat bills, chiefs, Jamie, your, your favorite, favorite play in that game. Um, favorite play is probably still Daryl Williams, you know, again, price cheaper than, uh, than, than Clyde Edwards Hilaire, you know, and, and you, you don't want to look back, you know, both these games are rematches from what happened earlier this season. There are some things you could look at and say, okay, this could be replicated. Like I do think Mike Evans will struggle against Jair Alexander. We've seen that sure. from Evans. He struggled against Lattimore, you know, those, those type of things. I don't think Rogers is going to struggle against the bucks to the level that he did, but there's clearly that potential. But if you are looking for just something that can be replicated, we know that the bill's weakness is their run defense and they allowed the chiefs. And I think a lot of teams allowed the chiefs to run on them, but the chiefs did in that game. Edward uh, Clyde Edwards Hilaire had 26 carries for 161 yards in that game. And Darrell Williams has now played two games basically as the featured running back without Edwards Lair on the field. It was week 16, the first game without Edwards Lair. It was against Atlanta. He had 14 total touches in that game. And then we saw last week he had the 13 carries, average six yards a carry against the Browns and four catches on four targets. So I think even if Edwards Lair plays, he's still going to have a significant role to what level we'll find out. But uh, he could be now their Leonard Fournette ahead of Ronald Jones in, in that same comparison as the second guy stepping up playing more than the first guy. So Based on his price, based on what the opportunity is, if this game becomes uh, a track meet like a lot of people are expecting it to be, which I think it will as well, um, Williams in the passing game will play over Edwards Hilaire because I do think there's a little bit more trust for Mahomes uh, based on what Williams has done. That's a good call. I like it. I like Kelsey as just an obvious put in your lineup and then build around that type of guy. And he's going to obviously be popular, but you just look at the numbers he's been putting up. It's like 90 yards and a touchdown and – five of his last six games, something ridiculous like that. And not to bring up Jacob again, but the, the whole tight ends or Kelsey against zone coverage thing, he's going to see a lot of zone coverage against Buffalo. That's what they do. That's what they did when they played them earlier this year. I'm certain that that's what they're going to do a lot of again this week. And I think Kelsey just continues dominating against that defense. Really don't need to go into Travis Kelsey is why well, he he's a good he start twice in that first game. Uh, he only had seven. It was a weird game because mm-hmm. that was uh, Tyree kill. Uh, I don't think he, it was like his first bad game of the year. Uh, yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't healthy at that point. He only had three targets, three catches for 20 yards. Um, Played most of the game though. Yeah. Uh, but they, you know, Patrick Holmes only threw the ball 26 times in that game, you know, so, or I'm sorry, he only completed 26 passes. Oh no, he threw 26 times. He only completed 21, 21 passes. of 26, something like uh, that. 21, 26, you know, so, you know, I, I, that, that's probably gonna be a half for him in this game, you know? So uh, I, I think, you'll see the the targets up the bills look for the most part when Milano has been on the field, the last couple of seasons, they've been really good against tight ends, but we saw the breakdown against the Colts and last week they were a little bit better, you know, we'll see. But I also think that uh, I'd go back to Cole Beasley in this game. Um, you know, John Brown was the, the big player last week. Beasley, I think has a chance to bounce back and play well in this game. Secondary is banged up for the chiefs. 
So there's a chance here for uh, – obviously, Diggs is going to be the guy, but for both John Brown and Cole Beasley, but Beasley's a little bit cheaper right now. Totally stole my guy. I thought he was like the best sleeper play in this game. Put him right into my lineup as well with Kelsey. One thing I wanted to mention on Kelsey, the price difference on him between FanDuel and DraftKings is only 600 So he's almost a better play on FanDuel than DraftKings because of it, but really he's a great play either way. That's not the case with Cole Beasley. He's 1600 less on DraftKings. That's huge. So I, I don't know if I'm going to definitely start. And the same thing with Valdez Scantling. Valdez Scantling's price is in the stratosphere on FanDuel, not so much on DraftKings. So if I'm going to play those two guys, I'd rather just load up lineups with them on DraftKings and maybe sprinkle them a little bit on FanDuel. Do you have picks for this game, Jamie? Or both games? Who, who's going to the Super Bowl? Uh, I mean, you know, it's it's hard to get away from the chalk. So I, I yeah. you know, before the playoffs started, Chiefs-Packers was my Super Bowl pick. I, I think I'll stick with it. Um, I, I Look, uh, personally speaking, I think it would be great for CBS to get uh, um, Mahomes versus Rodgers or Brady. Uh, I would love to see Josh Allen in the Super Bowl, but obviously from a marketing standpoint, <laughs> it works out better if it's Mahomes versus one of those two guys. Uh, but I do think it's going to be Chiefs Packers. I do too. I started the week thinking that the Bills had a shot, and the more I thought about their defense, the more I thought that Mahomes, assuming he's playing and he's fine, should be able to overcome it. It should be a close game. I think both games could be fairly close. I think the, the AFC game will be a little bit closer, but I agree with you. I think the home teams will win, and we will get a rematch of Super Bowl one with the Packers and the Chiefs. Jamie, thank you for the insight. Thanks for all that you do. Thank you for being a part of this podcast. Thank you for listening or watching us on YouTube. Thank you, Producer Shraggy B. I'm Dave Richard. Enjoy the games this weekend, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Want more of the Fantasy Football Today podcast and nonstop year-round fantasy advice? It's simple. Hit the subscribe button and hang with us all throughout the year.